Ja, Lorenz vom Hell äh, ist auf dem Bau Bad ist von Johanna Kinder. Yes, so uh, thanks Ove. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, David Bindel and John Kleinberg. And we're going to talk today about uh, forming opinions. So let's start. This is Mario. And Mario has many opinions on many topics. For example, Mario believes that the tax rate should be 10%. But how did he form this opinion? He probably talked to his friends and family, asked them what they think the tax rate should be. Maybe he consulted some newspaper, which he trusted its content, or read a blog. And then he somehow aggregated all of this information to form his opinion. Now, his friends and family did the exact same process. They also talked to their friends and their family, maybe watched a TV show or read a blog, and then somehow aggregated all of this information to form their opinion. So we have here an opinion formation process, which takes place on this interaction network. And this network has both directed edges. So for example, Mario is influenced by the newspaper, but he's not influencing it. And both undirected edges. So Mario and Luigi are influencing each other. And this opinion formation process is what we want to study. But what we need to do first is model opinions. So we're going to choose a modeling, which is quite common in the literature. <coughs> we model opinions by numeric continuous values. And this is a one-dimensional uh, modeling, which uh, is popular in the literature, <coughs> mainly out of the phenomena of correlations of political beliefs. So since I've just told you that Mario believes that the tax rate should be low, you can guess with high probability that he's also uh, pro-life and against gun control. And this correlation between unrelated opinions kind of flattens the opinion space and make it roughly one-dimensional. So this is why this modeling is popular. And some examples of opinion which might have continuous values are location of the political spectrum, uh, the belief of what the tax rate should be, which is also a proxy of the location on the political spectrum, and just the probability of some event happening. Uh, one of the most well-known models on this subject is the De Groot model, which was suggested in 74 by Maurice De Groot, and it attempts to uh, explain how this opinion formation process on the network works. So we have a social network, possibly a weighted one, so possibly I value person A's opinion more than I value person B's opinion. And now this dynamic process is going to go in discrete time step. At time, t at time step t, agent i holds opinion z i t. And at the beginning of the process, each one of the agents holds opinion z i zero. Now at each time step, the agents are going to update their opinion. So each agent is going to ask all of his neighbors what their opinions are. And then he's going to update his opinion to the weighted average of his current opinion and all of the opinions of his neighbors, which is what we have in this update rule. And this repeated averaging converges to a consensus under some mild assumptions. Now, the issue of consensus is something that the vast literature on this subject is really focused about. There are many works asking questions such as, is the process going to converge to a consensus? To what value of consensus? What happens if we slightly change the model? So for example, what happens if we have stubborn players who are not going to change their opinion in this averaging process? How are they going to affect the convergence and the value of the convergence? So there are many works and they're really focused on the consensus. However, as the sociologist David Cracker has observed, and also many other sociologists, in real life, in many situations, people are not going to reach a consensus. So it makes a lot of sense to study models which don't predict consensus, and to understand how much society loses from the fact that consensus is not reached. And this is what we want to study. To do it, we're going to use a slightly different update tool, one that was suggested by Friedkin and Johnson in 1990. And now, each agent has an internal opinion, SI, which is not going to change in the averaging process. Now, you can think about this internal opinion as the values that this agent was raised to believe, as something he believes that this is the ground truth. It might even have some genetic component, as more speculative research suggests. But once we have these internal opinions, 
this process is no longer going to converge to, um, to a consensus, but it is going to converge to a Nash equilibrium in an actual game, which we are going to define next. And in this game, this update rule is the best response. So let me define the game. Every player is going to... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The difference is that um, this remains constant in all of the averaging process. Exactly. So all of these, you know, convergence and so on, all of these are just basically the, the eigenvectors of a certain matrix, um, right? And then, so what you're doing here, if you look at the, the graph, you're putting a you're putting a bunch of source nodes pointing to each. Well, you just removed the self loop from the node, from the node okay. and instead replaced it with right. a new node and uh, an edge. A new node that yeah. has only a self loop and an edge going out of it to this node. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so I guess it's not, yeah, that's not, it's not like the mild conditions from before. Right? Right. The yeah, before so there's no need for the mild condi yeah. conditions anymore, exactly. Exactly, it's always going to converge. I mean, it's like a boundary condition on, I mean, the standard block, right? So, like, if you only had, you know, one person had an SI and everyone else had, you know, an unchanged, it would look a bit like a page rank computation, or? Okay, maybe. Not sure if you follow exactly. If one person has an SI, then that, that SI is going to influence the entire graph. Yeah, it's going to Oh, you're right, yeah. Okay. So the game we want to study is the following game. Each player, uh, player i, is going to choose an opinion z i to hold, and player i's cost is going to uh, be determined by this cost function. So this cost function has two terms. The first term measures the discomfort the player is feeling from being far from his internal opinion, and the second term measures the discomfort the player is feeling from being far from his neighbor's opinions. And since we choose uh, a quadratic distance, we get that the Friedkin and Johnson update rule is the minimizer of this function. So we can just take the You can just take the derivative and we see that the minimizer is uh, taking an average of your internal opinions and the opinions of all of your neighbors. And uh, as we discussed, repeated averaging is going to always converge and uh, it's going to converge to a Nash equilibrium since this is the best response. And uh, we'll see uh, in a, uh, later that the Nash equilibrium is unique and always exists. Now we also want to talk about how much society loses from the fact that we don't reach a consensus. So we want to somehow quantify the social cost. And what we are going to do here is just take a sum over all the players' costs. So this is this social cost function. So were there any questions about the game? Uh, you, you sum, this summation, oh yeah, it's all in brackets. So yes. the sum over all players is the... Exactly. Okay, so let's start with talking about undirected graphs and let's see an example first. So yeah, we have here three players Let's for simplicity call them yellow, red, and green, or yellow, Mario, and green. Yellow has an internal opinion of zero, red an op internal opinion of half, and green opinion of one. And the fact that red's opinion is the exact average between yellow and green's opinion is going to play an important role in this example. So let's see what the Nash equilibrium is. We can just do uh, the repeated averaging. So yellow is going to average zero and half and get an opinion of uh, a quarter. Red is going to average zero, quarter, and one, and get an opinion of half. Green is going to average a quarter, one, and get three quarters. And in fact, this is the Nash equilibrium. Since Mario kept his half opinion, yellow and green are already in the average of their internal opinion and Mario's opinion. 
and half is still the average of quarter, half, and three quarters, so Mario is also in the average. So this is the Nash equilibrium, and we want to know what's the Nash equilibrium's cost. So let's look at yellow, for example. He's going to experience a cost of a quarter minus zero squared from being far from his internal opinion, plus an additional cost of a quarter minus zero squared from being far from Mario's opinion, so a total cost of one over eight. And if you do the math for red and green, you get that each one of them is also going to experience a cost of one over eight. So the total cost is three over eight. Yeah. You wrote, you wrote the total cost in a particular way, like the sum over the different squares, but probably it's better to write it like the di diagonal term plus the, like whatever you player experiences relative to its own belief. That's uh, that. And then there is a variance. Uh, so we're going to write it a bit oh differently yeah, right. later. Okay. okay. And uh, on the other hand, we have the optimal solution. And if in the optimal solution, yellow and green should compromise more. They should hold opinions closer to Mario's opinion, since basically the cost associated with each one of the edges is counted twice, once for each of the edge points. And in order to reduce the cost, we need to somehow release the tension on the edges. And Mario is stuck in the middle, since he's exactly in the average between yellow and green. So we cannot shift his opinion in any useful way. Therefore, to reduce the cost, yellow and green have to compromise more, have to, uh, um, have to use opinions closer to Mario's opinions. But the problem is that yellow and green are unaware of all of this, or simply don't care. They don't care about the fact, the ex externalities of the actions, about the fact that the cost associated with the edges is doubled. And we want to know how much society loses from the fact that they don't care. We want to know what is the price of anarchy of this game. What is the ratio between the cost of the Nash equilibrium and the cost of the optimal solution? Optimal is, uh, optimized in social costs. Optimal is in social costs, yes. Yes. It's global. But but um, but you can look at this. Can can I look at this instead as you know what's driving the Nash equilibrium is you can you know nail things along the line and have springs connecting it, right? I mean that's you know, yeah. your function. And the difference is that the Nash equilibrium is optimizing something where the edges aren't counted twice. Exactly. Where they're counted, you know, the same as the things connecting it to the sources. Well, exactly. And your optimum now is counting the edges, the s you know, the, the between players twice. Yeah, we'll, we'll see this exact same argument oh, okay. in a few slides. Okay. So um, this is a very simple example. And for quite some time, we were trying to find a different example of undirected graph for which we can get a worse price of anarchy. But we couldn't come up with one. And in fact, this simple example is the worst case. So for any undirected graph, the price of anarchy is bounded by 9 over 8. And this is a tight bound, as we see from this example. So I'll show you how to prove this uh, theorem in a bit. But let's first quickly go over an outline of the talk. So we're going to continue talking about undirected graphs and how we prove uh, theorem one, that the price of anarchy is bounded by 9 over 8. Then we'll uh, switch gears and talk about the uh, directed graphs. So once we have directed graphs, we can model things such as Mario is influenced by the newspaper, but he's not influencing it. And we're going to see that once we throw in directed edges, the price of anarchy can be unbounded. So we're going to be interested in finding families of graphs for which we can get some bound on the price of anarchy. And the last thing we are going to do is to ask a more design question. So say we are given a network. How can we add edges to the network in order to reduce the cost of the Nash equilibrium? Okay. We'll talk about it later. So the directed you also uh, allow i to be influenced by j and j to be influenced by i, but not with the same way? Uh, um, so you allow the undirected edges and directed edges. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah. 
Yeah, it shouldn't be the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So to prove that the path of anarchy is bounded by nine over eight, we first need to get some uh, expressions for the optimal solution, uh, Nash equilibrium, social cost function. And for the optimal solution, we can write it in a slightly different way. So we can separate the sum over all the edges, the tension on the edges, which is counted uh, twice. And we can uh, separate uh, the uh, cost, uh, which is associated with the uh, players, with the distance from the internal opinions. And now we can just take a partial derivative. Here we have one with respect to zi, compare it to zero. And after some rearranging, we get uh, this uh, system of equations. So this one is for i. And uh, this part of the system equals to uh, the Laplacian uh, of the graph z, where the Laplacian of the graph is this matrix. On the diagonal, for each one of the nodes, we have the sum of the weights of all of its neighbors. So recall that this network can be weighted. And off the diagonal, we have minus the weight of the edge. And uh, so we can just multiply uh, the first line by z and see that this is exactly the same. And uh, this part we can write just as the identity matrix multiplied by z. And here we have just the vector of internal opinions. So our optimal solution, uh, we can get it by uh, uh, write the system of equations more succinctly. So just 2L plus i multiplied by z. We want it to be equal to s, the vector of internal opinions. We can multiply it by the inverse of 2L plus i, and we get that this is the optimal solution. And the optimal solution is unique and always exists, since the Laplacian is a positive semi-definite matrix. And if we add the, uh, the identity matrix, we're going to get a positive definite matrix. So uh, 2L plus i is invertible, and the optimal solution is unique and always exists. Uh, question? Uh, yeah, so um, this uh, so sociology model, um, I guess sociologists are not Bayesians, unlike Economists, I mean, they don't update their opinion. The opinion is not updated based on your information. You claim late, right? Sorry? You claim late. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking online. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, the opinion uh, is. Uh, if you so, we started with a process in which the opinion is updated. So, we teach, uh, there is, uh, the process goes in time steps, and it teaches time steps. Oh, no, I meant the internal opinion. OK. So we started with in a model in which the internal opinion is updated. And in this model, it wasn't an internal opinion. But the problem with this model is that it's always going to converge to a consensus, which is not totally realistic. So we switch to a different model, which was also suggested by a sociologist, in which there is a fixed internal opinion, which is not going to change. So you can think about something that you were born with. Like, you, it's something that is is not going to change. No matter how many new information you're going to get, you're going to still believe that this is the truth. And so what's your final opinion then? Uh, yeah. So even though you know that this is the truth, you know that if you will express this true opinion, then there will be a lot of discomfort from expressing these really different opinions for the opinions of your friends. So we're going to somehow compromise and express a slightly different opinion just to you know, make everyone feel better or make yourself feel better. Um, yeah. yeah, basically. So, why don't you? <laughs> um, so, what, what, is there any heuristic why? I mean, but, 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 it, but it's, it's, it's adding up two terms which a priori have no, uh, not in a common scale. I mean, one is a sort of discomfort with yourself and the other one. So you actually can have a weight here as well, and then you will have just the same problem. I mean, the difference between the two is just because when I have different opinion than you, then I'm experiencing some cost out of it, and you are experiencing cost out of it. When I have opinions different from my internal opinion, only I'm suffering for it. So this is why we have these two terms. So we'll see something similar to it in a second. OK. So uh, we also want an, ex want an expression for the uh, social cost function. So here we have the social cost function again. 
And we can write it more succinctly just as this, z transpose to Lz. Well, uh, throughout the talk, we're going to denote the matrix which governs the discomfort on the edges, the tension on the edges by A. And for undirected graphs, it's just twice the Laplacian. Okay, so this is this part. And this is again the distance from the internal opinion. And we've just seen that the optimal solution is the inverse of A plus I multiplied by S. For the Nash equilibrium, what we can do is write a system of equations, one for each player. For each player, we can take a derivative out of its cost function, and then we compare it to zero, and we get that the solution, uh, that the Nash equilibrium, the solution for the system, is the inverse of half A plus I multiplied by S, which uh, again, just for the same reasons, uh, the, the Nash equilibrium is unique and always exists. Okay? So before showing you how we prove that the price of anarchy is bounded by nan over eight, let me show you a simpler bound, which have to do with some of the ideas that you uh, just suggested. So the Nash equilibrium is actually the minimizer of a different function. If we have here uh, half A, so say this was the social cost, the Nash equilibrium is a minimizer of this. And because of this property, we can get an immediate bound of two on the price of anarchy. So we want to bound the price of anarchy, the ratio between the cost of the Nash equilibrium and the cost of the optimal solution. We know that this, uh, the cost function is less than twice uh, f. We know that x is the minimizer, so we can substitute by O and O increase the value. So we get a simple bound on two, of two on the price of anarchy. And this method only works for undirected graphs. Since only for undirected graphs, we have this kind of powerful property that the Nash equilibrium is actually the minimizer of some function. And this function has a nice structure. So the two, this function only differ from the social cost function by the coefficient of half on the z transpose a z term. And this is what helps us get this easy bound. Okay, so let's start proving that the price of anarchy is bounded by nine over eight. We're first going to uh, plug in the expression for the optimal solution in the social cost function. We are going to get this nasty expression, which we can simplify a bit and get this nasty expression. And we can do just the same for the Nash equilibrium. Now we can name this matrix B and this one C, and now everything looks nicer. So <laughs> we want to bound the price of anarchy, the cost of the Nash equilibrium, the ratio between the cost of Nash equilibrium and the optimal solution, which now equals S transpose CS over S transpose BS. Now in order to get some handle on this bound, what we need to do is find some relation between C and B, write them in some common terms. And what's going to help us to do it is the fact that B and C are rational functions of A. And this implies that A, B, and C are simultaneously diagonalizable. So there exists this orthogonal matrix Q, such that A equals Q lambda A Q transpose, where lambda A is the diagonal uh, matrix with the eigenvalues of A on the diagonal. And the same goes for B and for C. Okay, and now we know that the price of anarchy is bounded by this ratio. And uh, an additional fact about uh, A, B, and C is that all of them have the same eigenvectors. And th this matrix Q has uh, the eigenvectors on its column. So let's look at uh, the denominator of this expression more pictorially. So we have S transpose, then we have the matrix Q, the eigenvectors of A, B, and C are on the columns. Then we have lambda C, the diagonal matrix with uh, the eigenvalues of C on the diagonal, Q transpose, the eigenvectors now on the rows, and multiply it by uh, S, the vector of internal opinions. And we can simplify, simplify it by defining S prime to be Q transpose S, and now it's just S prime transpose, the diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues of C, and S prime. And now we can just do the multiplication, and we get that the price of anarchy is bounded by this ratio which we can further bound by max i lambda i c over lambda i b. Okay, so now we know that the price of anarchy is bounded by this ratio of eigenvalues. And again, we can use the fact that b and c are rational functions of a. Therefore, we can write the eigenvalues of b and c. Question? Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, after, after the transformation. Yes. Sorry, okay, so let me try only after the transformation. Okay, sorry, good. 
<laughs> yeah, but it's the next slide. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we can write lambda i b and lambda i c as rational functions of the eigenvalues of a. So if lambda i is an eigenvalue of a, then lambda i plus lambda i plus 1 is an eigenvalue of b, and the same for c. And now we can just uh, divide them one by another, and we get that the price of anarchy is bounded by phi lambda. So uh, the maximal value of phi lambda is going to be an upper bound on the price of anarchy. So this is how this function looks like. It attains its maximum when lambda equals 2. And at this point, it has a value of 9 over 8. So we have that phi lambda is bounded by 9 over 8. The price of anarchy is bounded by phi lambda. Therefore, the price of anarchy is bounded by 9 over 8. Okay? And this concludes our proof. Um, so well, you can have a parameterized bound here as a function of right. yeah, that you weighting can. term, right? You can. Yeah. But, you but, but you can take Russell's comment from before, and you take the graph, and then you copy the nodes. And then you, from each of the nodes, you put it in the directory that is back to the graph, right? It's directed. And, 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 then, it's, and then, yeah. it's then it's directed, but, but now you can do the eigenvalues in this. And then if you change it to the, the optimum model, all you're doing is you're adding edges from each of the copied nodes to each of the neighbors. Directed edges from there to the neighbors. So you're just doing the same thing on a slightly different graph. And you're just computing the, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this graph now. And I think what, what's going on in the map here is just showing how these graphs are slightly different. But you need that these things are simultaneously diagonalized. Yeah. Right? Yes. So that's a very strong condition. Yeah. So I'm not sure this, I mean, this won't be true in we're graphs. going to talk about uh, directed but graphs. But it comes from the fact that the way that these things are, where you get these graphs is from doing basis manipulation to the original thing. And that's why the, that's why these are rational functions of the same original basis manipulation. So I guess it's the question of, I mean, whether you believe that this model is true or not. Like, if you believe that this model has, is modeling something, then just Multiplying parts of the formula by you know by some parameter shouldn't necessarily make sense. To get these weights on having people um, people have different weights on their internal opinions, we can do it inside this model and we can still get the same results. So even if people have different weights on their internal opinions, or even if we have some people that completely don't care or about their internal opinion, we can still have this bound of nine over eight for undirected graphs. Um, the result is more general than it is valid. So for any parameter of weighting, you know, the factor you give to your discomfort from your own opinion and the other and the other weight from, from your neighbors, whatever weighting you give that you get by the same technique, you get the bound. Yeah. And in the case there is lots of suggestion it will be just one. So you know yeah. that otherwise you get just one. Yeah, I agree. So uh, also, by the way, so in the standard like price of anarchy thing, just for the routing, they have this nice result that um, you know the price of anarchy is. I mean, not only do they have a bound on it, but uh, you know the worst case is always achieved for a net, you know, a, a network of parallel, you know, just two parallel lengths, right? So can you get something similar here? Is there a more qualitative statement of you know to form, you know, if you assume some sort of cost function? Uh, you know, on the edges, is there, you know, without loss generality, a network which, you know, would be the worst case? So we didn't really try to work, do you mean also with different cost functions? Well, I mean, like one, you know, conjectured example you could have is really in your, you know, three-person example, you really have only two opinions that are really anchoring things, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you could imagine that the worst case example just has one positive, opinion one you know smaller opinion and that you know networks of this form would always be the things which achieve the worst uh, case price of anarchy no so my question was uh, are you asking this question with this specific cost function or with sure okay so next slide <laughs> okay okay so uh, so basically 
we can ask a different question. So say we have a graph, and we want to find what is the price of maximum price of anarchy for this graph, and what is the vector of internal opinions lead yielding this maximal price of anarchy. So what we can do is look at the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of this graph, of the matrix A, and find which one of them maximizes the function phi lambda. And the one maximizing uh, phi lambda is going to be the maximal price of anarchy. The price of anarchy is going to be phi lambda j, if lambda j here is the maximum. And uh, as Avi mentioned, what we need to do is make this uh, previously uh, less than or equal sign to be equal. And what you do is just pick S prime J to be equal one and S prime I for all um, other players equal zero. And we, we transform it back um, to the original opinion space. We have that the internal opinions yielding this maximal price of anarchy is uh, the eigenvector associated with this eigenvalue. So, so exactly, exactly. So I don't know of any interesting characterizations of graph with Laplacian that have eigenvalue of one. But I mean, yeah. So, so yeah. But this is the characterization of the worst case. So uh, the graph topology defines some uh, upper bound on the price of anarchy, and then we have that the internal opinions determines where exactly is the price of anarchy in this predefined range. So this pretty much settles the case for undirected graphs, since we've seen that the price of anarchy is pretty low, it's only nine over eight, so society doesn't lose too much. However, once we have uh, directed edges, then things are going to be different. So um, our canonical example for directed graphs is this star example. In the center, in the center. Yeah, and you, and you can also use the um, eigenvector associated with eigenvalue zero to get more opinions, right? Like any combination. Yeah, exactly. Um, so our canonical example is an indirected star. In the center, we have this uh, king, manager, celebrity, someone who doesn't care about anyone's opinion, but everyone cares about his opinion. And once this guy has an internal opinion of one, which is different than the internal opinions of the rest of the people, the cost of the Nash equilibrium is going to be pretty high. Since in the Nash equilibrium, each of the red guys is going to hold an opinion of half, and he's going to experience a cost of half. And if we have n such red guys, the total cost is going to be half n. On the other hand, if some outsider will tell this central guy, this king, how much agony he's causing everyone just because he's expressing the maybe wrong opinion, then he might express a different opinion. And then we get a solution with a cost of one. And if we do the exact computation, we can get an optimal solution with a cost of slightly less than one. So the price of anarchy in this example is really, really high. And this is not just because the fact that the um, central guy here has unbounded degree. It can also happen in graphs with bounded degree. So consider this a tree, which can, you can think about it as uh, some organizational chart. On the top, we have this uh, big manager. Uh, then we have a layer of, uh, less, uh, of senior managers, and less senior managers, and so on. And if in this organization, the big manager has an internal opinion of one, the rest of the organization have internal opinions of zero, then again, the cost of the Nash equilibrium is going to be pretty high. So all of the red guys are the exact same situation they were in the star example. So each one is going to hold opinion of half. For the blue guys, each one is going to average his internal opinion of zero with the red guy internal, internal opinion, uh, expressed opinion of half, and they will hold an opinion of quarter, and this goes on and on. We want to know what is the cost of this Nash equilibrium, so the best way to do it is look uh, on each layer separately. So for the red layer, we have eight guys. Each one has a cost of half, so the total cost is four. For the blue uh, layer, we have 64 uh, blue guys. Each one has a cost of one over eight, so the total cost is eight. And we can uh, generalize this formula. So basically, the total cost of layer i is two i plus one. 
Okay, the details don't really matter. But once we uh, sum up over all the layers, we have that the total cost is O of uh, is uh, something like n to the third. And in the optimal solution, someone should uh, tell this uh, manager that he's just joining his company since he's expressing the wrong opinion and he's making everyone uh, really feel really bad. Right? So again, we have a really big price of anarchy. And as we, uh, so if we look at uh, a DR3 with uh, a degree uh, getting higher and higher, we are just going to approach the star, star example. So our price of anarchy is going to approach linear. And if we reduce it, then the price of anarchy will uh, get smaller. So um, a little bit more formally about uh, directed graphs. We can still define the cost function as z transpose a z plus the square norm of z minus s. Only now a, uh, the matrix A measuring the tension on the edges is no longer twice the Laplacian. Uh, a good way to describe it is as the Laplacian of a different graph. So if this is our original graph, A is the Laplacian of this graph, we just get rid of all of the uh, directions of the edges. And the weight of each edge now is the sum of the weights going in uh, reverse directions, okay? Which is uh, written here more formally. So this is our matrix A. And for directed graphs, what we can show is that given a, direc a directed graph G, we can find the maximal price of anarchy and the eternal penis vector yielding it in polynomial time. Uh, the proof is a generalization of the proof for undirected graphs. We can define matrices B and C as before. However, they are no longer going to be simultaneously uh, diagonalizable with A, basically because uh, part of the matrix C is the Laplacian, which is uh, now an uh, asymmetric uh, matrix, and A is a symmetric matrix, so we can't get them to be rational functions of A. So the only thing we can uh, get is uh, just find the worst price of anarchy and the vector of uh, internal opinions uh, yielding it. Uh, because of this result and also because of the um, examples in which we, we have seen that the price of anarchy can be unbounded, what's interesting here is to find specific families of graphs for which we can get a bound on the price of anarchy. And a good starting point is Eulerian graphs, since they are kind of similar in essence to undirected graphs. And I guess the most simple one is a directed cycle. So let's say someone is giving us the uh, following claim. Someone tells us. Sorry, that can, can, can you go into detail now? So there you find the, uh, the price of anarchy as being what? So they are not saying denial is a being heavy thing, and therefore what's the what yeah, so generalized eigenvalue problem? Yeah, it's generalized eigenvalue problem, and you can symmetric, you can transform it to a symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, generalized eigenvalue problem. Okay. Right. Which is so we are supposed to. Just it's not rational. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's not immediate. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. We had an expert on uh, okay. such things. Uh, David Bindel is the expert. Okay. So uh, let's say uh, someone uh, tells us that for every directed cycle G and any internal opinions vector S, the cost of the Nash equilibrium is bounded by uh, twice Z transpose AZ plus the square norm of Z minus S. Okay, let's, some, let's say someone tells us this. Then we can show that given this, the price of anarchy of a directed cycle is bounded by two. So uh, let z1 be the minimizer of 2z transpose az plus the square norm of z minus s. And uh, the price of anarchy, we know that it's bounded by this ratio. And this is uh, similar to uh, the problem we just solved for undirected graphs. So it's again a generalized uh, eigenvalue problem. So we can solve it and get that the price of anarchy is bounded by 2 lambda 2 plus 2 over 2 lambda 2 plus 1, where lambda 2 is the second smallest eigenvalue. The minimizer of this. Oh, minimizer. It's just instead of writing minimum here. Uh -huh. And we are supposed to treat the rational equality. Um, so we should basically take the exact same steps as we did for undirected graphs. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, since we are dealing with a directed cycle, the matrix A is just the Laplacian of an undirected cycle. And for the, the Laplacian of an undirected cycle, 
the second smallest eigenvalue is approaching zero as the cycle gets bigger and bigger. So we have this bound, which is tight. And an additional fact about directed cycles is that the bound in claim one is also holds in, a qu in a equality for directed cycles. So for directed cycles, we have a tight bound of two. Okay? And uh, we can uh, generalize this. So tight means uh, the length of the cycle goes to infinity. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Cool. But you can get even exactly, so you can plug the eigenvalues with pi squared or squared. Yeah. So, so like you, you can take the eigenvalue of the cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can uh, generalize this uh, argument. And if G is a graph family for which there exists a beta, such that for every graph in the family and any internal opinions vector, the course of the Nash equilibrium is bounded by the minimum of beta Z transpose AZ plus the square norm of Z minus S, then we know that for every graph in the family, the price of anarchy is bounded by beta lambda two plus beta over beta lambda two plus one which is just what we did in the previous slide for beta equals two. Now, I want to give you some idea of when such a beta exists. And a uh, possible way of looking at it is we assume that Z1 is the minimizer of beta Z transpose AZ plus uh, Z minus S, uh, norm of Z minus S squared. Then Z1 is actually the optimal solution in a different network, one in which we multiplied the weights of all the edges by beta. And because of it, the optimal solution, and the optimal solution in any network is going to be smaller than the cost of the best consensus, since we can always just, um, since the best consensus is one of the solution considered when uh, computing the optimal solution. So basically, since we have here a minimum of a set of z's and here just a subset, we have that um, the optimal solution, Z1, the cost of uh, uh, the minimizer of uh, beta Z transpose AZ plus the square norm of Z minus S is bounded by the cost of the best consensus. And this means that beta exists if and only if the cost of the Nash equilibrium is smaller than the cost of the, beta of the best consensus. So if the cost of the Nash equilibrium is bigger than the cost of the best consensus, we certainly cannot find beta big enough in order to change this. And if uh, it is the other case, the cost of Nash equilibrium is smaller than the cost of the best consensus, then once we increase beta enough, we are going to reach uh, something very close to the best consensus since the tension on the edges is so high. Okay? But this was just an intuitive explanation. We still don't know how to find the value of beta if one exists. And uh, what we do is to get the value of beta, we use an intermediate function gz, such that the cost of the Nash equilibrium equals the minimum of this function. And this function has a specific form which helps us to get a bound, uh, to bound gz by a beta z transpose az plus the square norm of z minus s, okay? And uh, using this approach, we can show that for bounded degree Eulerian graphs, the cost of the Nash equilibrium is bounded by minimum of z, d1, uh, d plus one z transpose az plus the square norm of z minus s. So the price of anarchy of Eulerian graphs is bounded by uh, the maximal degree plus one. Now we don't know whether this is a tight bound or not. In fact, we don't even have examples of Eulerian graphs with price of anarchy greater than two. So this is an interesting open question. Uh, Um, so this intermediate function is, is basically, I can show you what it is if you want. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't provide any intuition. Uh, I guess um, so. I can go over this briefly. If you do, you want to see it? No, we can, okay, so I can. Do the biologists have these weird graphs that are kind of, or just 
something where I guess through similar to he got hierarchy, but then from having the feedback in the end, it was kind of a star. Do you think that? Uh, that okay, we should talk later. Yeah. Uh, because you are looking, for example, if we are small chain food. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can we talk later about it? <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to talk about it later. Um, and okay. And uh, so I'll show the function later. Um, something uh, else we can do is since we know that the path of anarchy is bounded by beta lambda 2 plus beta over beta lambda 2 plus 1 for your learning graphs, we can actually get a bound that doesn't depend on beta. So if we have Eulerian asymmetric expander with bounded degree d and expansion alpha, and by asymmetric I just mean that if a is influencing b, then b is not influencing a and vice versa. So out of the two edges, a, b, and b, a, at most one is part of the graph. And if we have this property, the matrix A is just the Laplacian of the underlying graph. And it's easy to define expansion, so expansion is just the expansion of this underlying graph. So for this kind of graph. And the expansion is a spectral expansion? Or yeah. 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 So the price of anarchy is bounded by uh, one, uh, 1 plus lambda 2 over lambda 2. And uh, by using a fact from spectral theory, we have that lambda 2 is upper bounded by 2d and lower bounded by alpha squared over 2d. So we can get that the price of anarchy is bounded by all of uh, d squared over alpha squared. OK. Now, uh, a different approach we can take in order to uh, uh, for directed graphs is to try and reduce the cost of the Nash equilibrium by adding edges. Or more formally, given an unweighted graph G, we want to add edges to the graph in order to create a graph G prime, such that the cost of the Nash equilibrium in the new graph is minimal. So this does not reflect the cost of that graph. So you want to add prime? So, uh, so it, it's not necessarily a social network because you can. Uh, so you can. Uh, actually, a good example of something which is social network is uh, Facebook newsfeed. So they have some algorithms trying to um, understand which uh, which uh, news from which of your friends they want to present to you. So this is kind of like adding edges to decide if they show you information from your friend, then it's kind of adding this edge because otherwise you wouldn't remember it. And you can also think about it as uh, we also had media sources there. So if you suggest some people to start reading this blog, then you, you don't add this edge, but you suggest them to add this edge. So this is a kind of situation which it roughly makes sense to add edges. And uh, I guess if you just take a person out of the street and tell him that you have this uh, society in which uh, everyone don't agree with each other, He's probably going to talk to tell you that people should talk more. This is like the basic solution people believe is true. But yeah. And uh, but, but once you think about it in the terms of our model, adding more edges is just adding positive terms to the social cost function. So a priori, it's not obvious that by adding positive terms to the cost function, we can actually reduce the cost of the Nash equilibrium. But in fact, we can. And let's see an example. Let's go back to the star example. So in the original star example, the cost of the Nash equilibrium was half n. Now, if we add just one edge, make this central guy listen to one, just one red guy, now the cost of the Nash equilibrium is going to be reduced to 2 over 9n, which asymptotically is just the same. But if you look at the ratio between the two expressions, we got quite a big improvement from just adding one edge. And if we go all the way and add all of the edges, edges from the yellow guy to all of the red guys, then the cost is going to be less than 1. And this is not specific just to this directed star example. So 
what we can do for any directed uh, graph. We can symmetrize, symmetrize the graph, and then we are going to get uh, a Nash equilibrium with a cost which is 9 over 4 approximation <coughs> to the original optimal solution. Okay? And to do it, we use the, um, we use the uh, price of anarchy result for undirected graphs, that the price of anarchy is bounded by 9 over 8. And in the worst case, when we symmetrize the graph, we uh, double the edges. So we got a Nash equilibrium with a cost which is 9 over 4 approximation to the original optimal solution. This means that Lady Gaga and Britney Spears have to listen to all this code of followers. I mean, in reversing the edges. But Basically, yes. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, for reversing the edges, you, it makes more sense to think so about it as so part of. sample doesn't work. So, in the, in the star example, is it, is it distributed like according to the number of listeners? Yeah, but how many edges do you have to add? Is it linear? I see. In Russell, let's say you just take a random sample and weight it according to the original weight of everything. Yeah. So you just want to I see. That to I see. I see. So it's it's you have a weight and a proportion to the total sample size. So that worked out for this one. Maybe. Okay. So you have to take a new sample every time. If you just add a ra random measure, that doesn't necessarily do it. Because then you're counting individuals as many as you can add. I said so the you the 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 No, if you take one of, if, if Madonna takes one of her followers and says, you're my head of my fan club, I'm going to listen to you, that's different from polling her fan club every time. Um, so uh, we know that the cost of Nash equilibrium cannot be less than the original optimal solution since we just added positive term. So this is a pretty good uh, approximation. However, uh, first of all, uh, we don't know whether this analysis was tight. There's a good chance that it's not tight. Even just by symmetrizing the graph, you can get, you get something better than 9 over 4 approximation. And it's an open question whether we can find the best set of edges to add to the graph in polynomial time. And we're also interested in some variants of this question. So for example, here we have uh, W, which is a blogger, and he's a very influential blogger. And we somehow want to reduce the cost of the Nash equilibrium by exposing this blogger to other media sources, to uh, yeah, other yeah, sources. Of edges where you don't limit their number at all? Or, or Without any limitations. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, but maybe it doesn't scale. Sure. Yeah, but right. So. But also, maybe it makes sense to ask, okay, what's the best you can do if you give me just say ten edges worth or something for 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 that. Two yeah. two bullets. So you can't cut edges. You can only add edges. Yeah. So yeah. Everybody can live in their own world. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, adding, I was just saying, adding the guy doesn't really help you. So the, the are actually some models which are doing things similar as this. So there are some models that are saying that if my opinion is too different than your opinion, then I just don't care about your opinion. We just don't talk about this subject at all. So it's kind of like doing the breaking edges thing. Well, the thing, you know, the whole, your whole model is um, people are, people's opinions are determined by their uh, friends and news sources, when in truth, it's more like people's friends and news sources are determined by their opinions. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, the worst case, I can write a can add negative W. So it's 
Yeah. Yeah. There there has been studies though done though that people underestimate the disagreement between them and their friends. Actually. So that people seem not to represent their true opinions to their friends that they disagree with. And this causes them some underestimation there. Actually. So something like this happens. Yeah. Yeah, so I would love to get a reference to this if you okay. think. Um so um, <coughs> finding the best set of edges from a specific node W or finding the best set of edges to add to a specific W. So again, this is a blogger, and now we want to expose some people to, our, to it in order to reduce the cost of a Nash equilibrium. And just finding the best set of K edges to add to the graph are all NP-hard problems. And the uh, open questions are finding approximations for all of the, these uh, three problems. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of okay. course. So uh, some open questions we talked about. Uh, can we find the best set of edges to add uh, to the graph? Can we find it in uh, uh, polynomial time? Uh, finding approximations to the NP-hard problems we just talked about. Uh, for bounded degree Eulerian graphs, is the bound of d plus 1 tight? Currently, we only know of Eulerian graphs with price of anarchy, which is 2. And uh, let me uh, summarize. We've seen that people are unaware of the externalities of their actions. They are unaware of the fact that the opinion they are holding has some uh, effect on their uh, neighbors, on their friends. And if the graph is undirected, then things are not that bad. The price of anarchy is bounded by 9 over 8. Once we have directed edges, then things get, uh, can get much worse, especially if we have someone who is very influential but doesn't care about anyone else's opinion, like the star example. And we've seen that for some topologies, uh, we can bound the price of anarchy, but it's an open question to get a more uh, profound characterization of what properties of the graph allow us to bound this price of anarchy. And the last thing we talked about is uh, how can we add uh, uh, edges to the graph in order to reduce the cost of the Nash equilibrium. Okay, so uh, this is it. Uh, thanks. So why do people uh, average their opinion? Uh, why, why do you think that the people average uh, opinions with two strings? Um, so uh, I'm not sure of concrete evidence that this is exactly how people average opinions. But and I actually think it might be uh, maybe easier to think about it in terms of our model, so that you want to somehow minimize the cost of something that you believe in and the cost you expressed uh, outside. I mean, uh, it might have to do with what uh, Grant just mentioned, right? Like what you read about. But in real life, do people say arguments, some kind of information of what you, they, <coughs> they have and so on? So, so the, in real life, there's something much more difficult thing happens than this, and uh, it's not clear at all why do you. I mean, it's a simplified model. Uh, most of the models are. No, but I, uh, I guess the question is the, do you know if they experiment? A social scientist do all these experiments, so uh, do they, when, when they, this is a model that was suggested by social scientists. You mentioned the names at the beginning, so I don't remember. Yes, do, do when they suggested it, did they you know, sort of validate it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether they, I don't think that they validated it. It's a reasonable yeah. validation. Okay. So when you get it there, then you can be really high. Yeah. No, I know, of course, yeah. But yeah. I mean, uh, you can, yeah. The question is, do you try whether they tried? <laughs> well, I think there's a difference between the sociology between like the theorists and the empiricists. So the sociologists are almost like theorists who maybe justify it based on kind of rational arguments. Yeah, so. Yeah, 
abstract model where people were you know bidding on the price of some good which no but it helps you know it's not the same yeah right I mean I think yeah what realistic models it's how would you experiment how would you experiment you got to work out what value is it nice to have a challenge no Yeah, I don't know, but it's an interesting direction, so yeah, definitely. And maybe it's completing more problems in a situation than in a physical setting? Yeah, I think that's why. I mean, so you were saying, so the I other ones, uh, Avi, you had this paper about how to use this for like parallel approximate, algorithmic to approximate uh, the largest eigenvalue or something, I think that's called, for the original, for the one before. <laughs> did you or uh, where you use this kind of you have a bipartite graph yeah. and you go back and forth to this kind of update? Yeah, that, that's the I mean the the yeah, I love this paper. Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, the only the only relation I mean this is a, yeah the, the original one comes up in uh, in all sorts of fields. So yeah, the 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but also yeah. Find the personal updates so that you convert it fast, faster, faster, yeah. and so you you modify the feedback factor of the. Uh, yeah. But that's a different question. So yeah. Different. So you, 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 you yeah. yeah. Just yeah. arrange it, it so that you convert fast. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, so Okay. Yeah, but it might so be a, a question of the bound. No, but you bound the uh, um, ratio yeah, between the two edges, right? So it will be a function of this bound. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, if it's it epsilon. Be, yeah, it could still be. Yeah. Going exponentially, it's like something. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe 